This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, my favorite year for reviewing movies, I have started, started reviewing movies in 1996. My favorite year has got to be 1999. So many great movies come out that year, and I think I got more movies on my Blu-ray connect collection from that year than any other. And one of the films that I picked up recently from that year, I happened to see at the old uh, Twin Cinemas here that's no longer open, is a little film called Election, starring Matthew Broderick and Reese Witherspoon in a, uh, a movie that really gained her some recognition. And I happen to have one of the actors from that movie on here tonight. I'm very excited to have her. Yes, she was the wife of Ferris Bueller in this movie, <laughs> Molly <laughs> Hagan. How you doing, Molly? I'm great. Thanks, Greg. Yes, uh, what an honor it is to have you on here tonight. I was so, so glad I was able to, to uh, get in touch with you. Well, it's one of my favorite movies, so I'm always happy to talk about it. You know, um, we got like a 10-screen theater here, and we did not get an election at that theater. In fact, uh, we used to have a twin cinemas across the river that play um, um, movies that ran their course, and they play over there for a cheaper price, and uh, but we had a few first-run movies play over there, and I remember 1999, two of them that played there that didn't play up at the big s cinemas. One was Election, the other was The Love Letter, both of which I really liked. I especially liked Election, and, it, and I went over there and s saw it at that Twin Cinemas, and uh, it's like it just blew me away, and uh, and um, really enjoyed that movie. And I think it was easily one of the best films of the year. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, um, I was so taken with it, I actually wrote a shot-for-shot -shot analysis on the film. <laughs> yeah, I did. And uh, I got it somewhere um, on uh, Flash Drive. But, um, yeah, I sat down and I just went through that film and all the symbolism that I could find in that film. Um, and I just wrote it down. And um, I'd never done that before, and, and I did that with election. It was uh, quite little analysis. But what I find interesting is when election came out, it did not do that well at the box office. And I didn't know that until recently. But people say critics don't know what they're talking about. But I'd say critics in many ways help that film gain the cult following that it has today. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why it wasn't released widely. I mean, a film, whether a film makes money or not, also has to do with on how many screens it is. And this was a smaller film. So... I, I don't think it was on as many screens as, you know, like a, a, a bigger movie would be. But no, the critics really love this movie. Yeah, it came out the same year that everybody was disappointed with Phantom Menace, including myself. So it was yeah. nice and refreshing to see something like Election. And uh, I'm going to tell you, the Academy Awards that year... Um, I was happy to see American Beauty win. I mean, The Insider could have won, and that would have been fine. But I would have gladly taken the Cider House Rules out of there, which, frankly, I thought the Cider House Rules was junk. I know, really? uh, yeah, I didn't care for it. I thought it was very disjointed and uh, very boring. And I would have replaced it with Election. Huh. I really like the Cider House Rules. I mean, I like Election, too, but... I mean, Election was very much an independent movie, and you know, Cider House Rules and and um, uh, American Beauty. I mean, they were just bigger movies, and so sometimes smaller. I think things have changed now. I think smaller movies, uh, or at least in TV. I mean, you know, things that are uh, on Netflix and stuff like that really can get some recognition. 
but um, back then, if it wasn't a wide release or a bigger movie, generally it was not going to get nominated. Well, Election did get a, an adapted screenplay nomination, and Reese Witherspoon was nominated for a Golden Globe, but I felt the film yeah. should have generated more than that. And I think because it was labeled as a teen comedy, that I think that that's, huh. yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God, it's so not a teen comedy. <laughs> yeah, but, um, no, I, I think it's a fantastic movie, and um, I th- think it's easily, easily one of the best films of 1999 and, and definitely one I recommend everybody check out. I love that poster uh, has, you know, the Reese Witherspoon's smiling face, and you can see Matthew Broderick's head inside her mouth, you know, just peering out with a hopeless <laughs> look on his face. What a great poster. Yeah. Yeah. How did you uh, get cast in that film? You, of course, played Broderick's wife in the film. I just I just auditioned. But um, when I read the script, I I was not familiar with Alexander Payne at that point. But I read the script and I went, wow, this is really funny, but in the wrong hands. This is not funny. I mean, because it would be over the top. So I went and I watched um, Citizen Ruth, which was his first movie. Okay. And I saw how how deftly he he directed that. And I went, oh. Oh, he's going to knock this out of the park. And also, I, and then after watching that, I knew how to audition. And then I was really excited about auditioning because I knew it was going to be wildly, sophisticatedly funny and everything played for keeps. And no matter how, you know, insane the voiceovers got or, or, or you know, how improbable some of the things might have been, it, they played it. For Keith and for real, and and um, which made it all the funnier. So uh, I just auditioned, and luckily he cast me. Well, Alexander Payne is definitely a director I've been watching. I mean, after election, he followed that up with about Schmidt, and he did Sideways and. The Descendants, we had a hard time getting that here. We finally ended up getting it, but unfortunately, we did not get Nebraska, which was, uh, I think, the last one he did. And I, you know, when you get a filmmaker like that who's actually trying to make good movies, it's it's unfortunate that um, uh, their films don't get wider respect theatrically. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So so what was he like as a director for you? He was very clear. I mean, one of the, I mean, the script really helps because I think I, he adapted the script. So the script was really, because I had watched Citizen Ruth and because I I knew what was needed, that it was just really obvious what to do and not to do. And that if I pushed at all at anything I tried, it would not be funny. And I had come from sitcoms, so my tendency was to really push, and I knew that I would have to go against all my instincts in order for this stuff to just live. And um, I just thought he was really clear. He was really clear in the writing. He's really clear on the set. And um, I adored him. I mean, I was, you know, I had a huge crush on him, too. Uh, I just think he's really friggin' smart. He's smart, and he's he communicates well and and he was and and he was just a gentleman and and uh it was just fun it's just fun and it was also fun because you knew you were in such great hands you know he was just really knew what he wanted and as far as an actor you can't ask for anything better than that yeah and uh Of course, you get to work with uh, Matthew Broderick, of course, who ends up in a very bad situation in this film. Now, you'd think he would have learned after, uh, you know, the film opens, of course, his his best friend, who is a fellow teacher, ends up getting into a very bad situation with Reese Witherspoon. And uh, you'd think Broderick would have, uh, of course, he doesn't get into the same bad situation, but he gets in a bad enough situation. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, it's pretty funny. You know, it's funny we're talking about this, and you get the 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 weirdness going on with the current election going on. And uh, I was watching this film the other night, and I was like, "Yeah, they're having the same chaos now." <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, you guys, what your your um, candidates only uh, campaign for only three months, right? Something like that. I don't know. I, I lay in low. Canada, yeah, I think in Canada they there's a very small window for campaigning, and here they campaign for two years with, with primaries and everything, or it seems like two years, and it is insane. It's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. But, um, uh, yeah, so uh, Mark Harlick, who plays his best friend in the piece, who gets into massive amounts of trouble and then ends up in some sort of big box store pricing things out, um, <laughs> is a friend of mine, Mark Harlick, and we'd done some theater together earlier than that. And uh, so we went to the cast and crew screening, and I totally forgot about his first line in the movie. And I almost, you know, projectile vomited <laughs> <laughs> my popcorn because it was so funny. And he's so funny in that movie. And he's so great. He's a great actor anyway, but he's just, uh, but he's so wonderful in this movie. And then Matthew Broderick was so great. He's, uh, I mean, Reese Witherspoon is really funny in the movie. But to me, Matthew Broderick is should have been nominated because what he did was so understated and so unbelievably funny. I I just thought he was, I I think it's like the best acting I've ever seen what he did in that movie. Just hilarious stuff. It's interesting. so, So sad. It's interesting because Alexander Payne made a reference in the commentary track that, uh, he said that this would be what, um, Ferris Beeler would be, when he got older, except <laughs> except unlike Ferris Bueller, um, McAllister kind of me- d- doesn't quite make the escape. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. No. Oh, so sad. So uh, awful. <laughs> e- even that little scene where he gets the bee sting on the eye. It's like it's like a warning going into that bad place and. He gets stung, you know. There's some interesting little parallels going on there in terms of stuff, symbolism going on in this movie. Yeah. What was <laughs> what was Matthew Broderick like to work with? Oh, he was very kind. He was very kind. Our first scene together was the bed scene. Okay. So he was like, hello, my name is Matthew Broderick. Let's go to bed. And, um, and that's always really weird is when you're first seen with someone and you're in bed with them. Um, he was... He was really, he was, he was, he's as funny as you would expect him to be, but darker. Like his, his sense of humor is just really dark, which cracks me up. Um, uh, and so, you know, it was just really fun working with him. I don't know what else to say. He's really funny, a legitimately funny human being. And he, he was, he was very nice to me. I find it funny you mentioned the first scene was the bedroom scene. Yeah, and uh, was it the one where you're um, on your hands and knees and all the faces are coming up <laughs> behind your head? It may have been. Because, <laughs> I mean, he's picturing everybody from Reese to the neighbor to... <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, but uh, and he's got that, that paranoid look on his face, like... Yeah, he's not going to be able to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, before we, before we had Hillary Clinton, we had Tracy Fleck, and of course, Reese Witherspoon knocked that out of the park. And totally. Yeah, and I still like even before Legally Blonde. I still think um, Election is right up there, one of the greatest. Uh, um, performances Reese is given. She's just this dislikable girl, and you can kind of understand why Broderick's character doesn't like her. Um, she's very ambitious, an overachiever, but it's how she goes about it. And, 
She's got a sadistic side. Well, when I when I first read the, the script, I went, "Oh my god, that's who I was in high school." <laughs> the person, you know, furiously waving their hand to be called on, and to see this and to read this as an adult, I was like, "Oh my god, no wonder why no one liked me." I mean, it was so <laughs> it was so awful reading that script for the first time and recognizing myself as a young woman as Tracy and the uh, yeah. But she really, I don't know, you know, that character is so tough. And she was so, she was so wonderful in how she portrayed it because you, you got what a huge outsider she was. And, and, and I mean, and people not liking her was not lost on her. I mean, it, it, it informed everything she did and it, and, and, and how she was. And I don't know, I just thought it was a genius performance. You weren't liked in high school. What was not the oh like my about God, you? Huh? <laughs> what was not the like? Oh, uh, I I was the girl waving the hand. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Call me, call me, call me, call me, call me. <laughs> and um, also disliked in grade school. Um, I had a big mouth on me, and uh, I was. <laughs> obnoxious and um no they just didn't dig it i'm also from the midwest and they the anything out of the norm is not a really okay in the midwest and i wasn't in the norm so oh. <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't well like high school either so <laughs> there you go but uh um, yeah, horrible oh yeah i, I too I, I prefer to forget school altogether. I've been out of school for over 25 years. And I tell you, I, I still got haunting memories. <laughs> I know. It's awful. It's really awful. It's like Midnight Express yeah. every day. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to you just want to escape like the guy at the end of that movie and run and jump up in the air. I'm free. <laughs> yeah, I just. Yeah, it's horrible. It's really horrible. And having all the popular people, you know, just pick on you and treat you like crap. I'm just, it's, it's, I, I, high school's not for the timid. I mean, I I pity any kid going through high school now. I just do. Awful. Yeah. Well, no, um, Tracy, Tracy Flick was, was also, you know, she had a kind of an arrogance to her, too, because it's like when she sees um, McAllister that, especially after he's had the bee sting and she goes, want a cupcake? <laughs> 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 you know, but and God. And, of course, he does not want her to win that election and, of course, uh, brings in Chris Klein, who's that, that popular yet likable football jock who's not exactly swift in the brain, but a likable guy. And, of course, he did American Pie the same year, so 1999 was a good year for him. Um, I know you yeah. didn't have any scenes with him, but did you did you meet him at all in that film? I, I No. I don't think I did. I met him several years later. He's a very nice man. Yeah, uh, yeah. I met him when he was a man. I don't <laughs> think I met him when he was a boy. You didn't meet him while he was there a were football. A lot of young people there. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, you didn't meet him when he was uh, going down the ski slope and bouncing up and down, <laughs> <laughs> cursing the world. No. <laughs> I'll tell you, one of my favorite scenes in the movie was. I, I loved Jessica Campbell in the movie. That speech, oh God, yeah. that speech she gives is probably the most powerful moment in the film because every single person watching that movie has thought the very same thing that she says. We've all thought it. That was spot on perfection. <laughs> well, Seeing as I was Tracy Flick in high school, uh, I did not like the speech. <laughs> I mean, I, she was great. But, I mean, I, I, I was like, what do you mean you don't care? You've got to care. <laughs> yep. you got to care. Oh, I love the fact that, uh, you know, of course, she played um, uh, Chris Klein's sister in the movie, who's also, um, I guess, a closet uh, lesbian. And, of course, the girl she was involved with, of course, ends up 
breaking up with her because she's more interested in Chris Klein. Of course, Chris Klein can't read between the lines of <laughs> why they don't get al- why she don't get along with her sister anymore. But <laughs> nonetheless, um, but. <laughs> yeah, but I thought Jessica Campbell's character was so well drawn, and the fact that she wanted yeah. kicked out of school. I know it's fantastic. Yeah, she wanted kicked out so bad that she was she, she willing to take a fall for the very person we want to take the hit. <laughs> But yeah, she was fantastic in that movie as well, and uh, you had a lot of um, um, good talent in that movie. Colleen Camp, of course, was in that as well as uh, Tracy Flick's mom, and uh, somebody you worked with, uh, De- um, Delaney Driscoll, of course, played the neighbor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't see her much. Anything? Is, is she still working? Well, the thing is, is that he cast. Alexander cast like uh, like Jessica. Jessica was cast out of I think Missouri. He looked all over for her, and then uh, Delaney. Uh, she was cast out of um, out of uh, where was it shot? <laughs> I don't Omaha. remember. Oh, Omaha. She was cast okay. in Omaha. She was cast in Omaha, Nebraska. So she was an actor who was local. So she, you know, she does regional theater. She does a lot of theater, and she. I don't think she's ever come out to L.A. And um, so unless a movie goes to, you know, Omaha, you're probably not going to see her um, because she's a stage actor. But uh, but uh, yeah, he cast he cast locals. And um, so that's why you don't see her. And and I I don't think Jessica Campbell was interested in acting anymore. So that's why you don't see her. And um, it's fascinating. But he yeah, he cast a lot of local or went on. all over to get unique talent. Well, that's unfortunate. Jessica Campbell, I think, I think she would have, might have made it big had she kept going. I think so too. I think she just wasn't interested. Wow. I think she wasn't interested. Wow. <laughs> and um, of course, um, uh, Delaney, of course, playing playing the wife of. Uh, of uh, Broderick's uh, teacher pal that had already gotten in trouble and kicked out of teaching. And uh, and some people might say that she led Broderick on, but, you know, Broderick also, in, uh, in her defense, i got to say, Broderick kind of walked into that as well. <laughs> he could have <laughs> walked away. Oh, it's complicated. It you know, is complicated. Adults have complicated lives. And when you get divorced, things happen. And yet, you need. it was. And then you realize maybe that's not such a good a thing. And <laughs> well, I, I'll say this, like I said, and it was beautifully written together. The screenplay was just was tight knit. Uh, I don't think there's anything I would change in it. I, I think it was. Uh, I think it dealt with something that we all dealt with in high school: the, the elections in high school and and peer pressure. And uh, and he took what um, Payne took what could have been just formulaic characters and made them broad and appealing, like the football jock, the overachiever, and 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 he was able to make them into really well-drawn three-dimensional characters, and that's a major yeah. testament to Payne's talent. I agree. Yeah. So uh, I was surprised when I found out the film didn't do well, but it's interesting because the fact that I was surprised indicates the that unlike something like Cutthroat Island or Waterworld, which are known as being renowned flops, um, I think Election pretty much gained back any losses just by its critical success, and it managed to gain, like I said, a cult following, and uh, I think it's more remembered for that than anything. It's it's uh, it's actually a very well-respected re- uh, film, and I, I think that's... Uh, an achievement all its own. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how many days were you on that film? I feel, I feel like I was in Omaha a couple of weeks. Was it I a- don't know. I, I think I also went back and forth. I'm not really sure. I can't remember. It's been a long time. And I do know that there was a huge ice storm. Okay. 
while we were shooting, and so I think production had to stop. I feel like I I went there for a few days and then came back to L.A. and then went back. Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't remember. What, was there anything uh, complicated or difficult about your shoot, or was it just easy sailing? I thought it was easy sailing, but I, I, the production was not because there was a you know an ice storm that shut production down, and there was there were a lot of problems. But for me as an actor, it was easy. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you've also done some other interesting uh, films, of course. Uh, you you were in Code of Silence. You got to work with Chuck <laughs> Norris. <laughs> yeah, that was my first movie. That was in Chicago, yeah. Your first movie, and it was with Chuck Norris. Yes. What was that like? He was... <laughs> He's very fast. We were sitting around one day, and um, he made a joke or something, and was teasing me, and I went to hit him, just like, you know, as a joke or something. And he jokingly also blocked the hit, but I never saw someone move that fast in my life. I mean, he's the real deal. I mean, he's a, you know, he's a real martial artist, and at the time, he was, um, you know, really on top of his game. But I, I, I was like, oh, my God, I've never seen anyone move that fast in my life. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, um, you don't see Chuck Norris much anymore, but I remember um, uh, he was in Expendables 2, and the moment he appears, everybody in the theater, like, cheers, because it's like, ah, <laughs> Chuck Norris is back, you know? That's fun. Yeah. Now you're in Code of Silence. Of course, that was um, directed by Andrew Davis. Now, um, he went, of course, went on to do The Fugitive. Um what was it like, like between Andrew Davis and Alexander Payne? Now, both very different directors. Uh, what, what would, what was your? Um, um, I'm trying to think of the way to word this. Uh, the contrast between the two directors, within your experience. Um, Andrew Davis's father was an actor um, from Chicago, and I think that Andrew really sort of understood acting um and was this is not meant to be insulting to anyone i'm just these are my opinions no no, no um and this, it was more um he's from chicago he's sort of more down to earth more you know your average guy okay and but really could handle big stuff really could see big picture and, you know, because there's a lot of moving parts in Code of Silence and then, you know, obviously The Fugitive and, and the other movies he, he did, they're like big, huge moving set pieces and, and um, they're, they're big films. And he really had a, a great eye um, and he also had uh, a, a great way with actors. I would say Alexander Payne is much more of an intellectual Okay. And although he's very clear and can, uh, so they're really two different. They both see what they want, and I think they're both really good at it. But Alexander was sort of raised by Jesuits and sort of, you know, intellectual. And, and Andrew Davis is like, you know, Andy is, is from Chicago and, and is just more, you know, people oriented. I don't, I don't know. They're, they're completely different. Yeah, I, I get. I get in their own way. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You, you know, I know one's one's a big action film director, and the other is. Um, um, I'd say Payne pays a little more to detail in terms of character and, and the screenplay too, where as um, Davis's films are. Well, that's the other thing is Alexander's a writer, and, and Andy's not a writer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, you you you. Um, you worked with, for both of them, and they're both kind of like on opposite ends of the planes in terms of uh, um, what they what their scope is uh, in terms of uh, the films they make. But Andy's really good at. I mean, Andy's really human, yeah. um, and really understands because his father's an actor. He 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 knows how to speak to actors. He understands the human component, and you know, no matter how big these action movies are, the, it, I think the the characters in it are very strong and human, and they're not just like to me. The action is a 
part of it, but it doesn't necessarily lead it. I, I mean, I think Andy's really good with actors. Oh, I so, agree. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, uh, you did Some Kind of Wonderful and uh, with uh, Howard. Um, how do you pronounce his last name? Deutsch. Deutsch? Deutsch. Okay. It, it's interesting you say that because his daughter, Zoe, was in a movie this year that I saw nine times at the theater. And I'd never seen a movie nine times in the theater before. And it's one of those smaller movies like Election. And it was called Everybody Wants Some. And I loved it. And uh, Oh, wow. I didn't know she. I didn't. I didn't know he had a kid who acted. That's cool. Yeah, Zo- Zoe, and uh, of course, um, Howard was is married to Leah Thompson. Now, when this is funny because um, the first time I saw Zoe, I thought, "What? Well, who this girl is? What else has she done?" And I looked her up, and I thought she was really nice looking. And I come to find out why, because she gets it from her mom. <laughs> <laughs> Leah's really nice looking. <laughs> and, very and, beautiful. Well, Zoe's got Leah's eyes, but um, I, I don't know her. No, no, but um, that was that was that kind of uh, connection I made when I was looking Zoe up, and uh, she was in that great movie this year, and uh, some kind of wonderful, of course. Uh, uh, brings you into uh, a teen flick that was written by um, John Hughes. Did you meet John Hughes? You know, I, he was on the set, I think, only one day. So, I, and so yes, I met him briefly. And I would have really liked to have, you know, gotten to really speak with him, but I didn't. I didn't get to. Yeah, it's unfortunate. He uh, passed way too soon, I think. I remember when he had passed away. Absolutely. Tragic accident. and uh, But you had a, uh, an interesting bunch of actors and some kind of wonderful uh, Eric Stoltz, um, Mary Stuart Matters- Masterson, and Leah Thompson, uh, Elias Cortez. you have any interesting stories about them? Elias Katias is one of my favorite actors. Loved him um, in that film. <laughs> oh, and he's and he's good in everything he does. Um, he's just a very committed and interesting actor. And uh, I was just terrified of him. <laughs> well, he, 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 <laughs> he, I believe he's the sweetest, kindest human ever. But he he just did a really good job <laughs> in the movie, and he scared me to death. Well, I like but, the fact um, I like the fact with Elias that he starts out one way and he ends up in a very different place by the end of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. What else would you guys say about him? Huh? Oh, oh I thought that's I, it. I thought you was going to add something. Okay. But no, uh, no, he was I think the most interesting one in the movie too and uh Yeah. And uh Mary Stuart Masterson um, and uh, Eric Stoltz and uh, Leah Thompson, all in that, and uh, of course yourself. But uh, what was your experience like on that film? Um, that was really interesting for me because all the other people had worked a great deal. And uh, or more than I had, and um, I, and I came from a relatively poor background, and uh, listening to them all talk was it was amazing to me because they'd all worked a lot, so they all had their own money. I mean, I had my own money too, but my own money was <laughs> like two hundred dollars in a savings account, um, and. You know, I was had roommates and and um, you know I was struggling to you know just survive and and they were talking about buying businesses and I was like, wow, this is a whole different world. I don't I don't know anything about this level of uh, success these other people have. It was interesting. It was really interesting. It was it was it was the first time I had met young people who were really who were my age who were really successful and and who you know made a lot of money and so that was 
was it was fascinating to me, and I went, hmm, maybe I could make money too. You know, what's interesting about Some Kind of Wonderful is that um, John Hughes, of course, uh, who didn't, he didn't direct this, but he, of course, had success with, you know, 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Pretty in Pink, and he wanted, I guess he wanted um, Molly Ringwald in this movie, and uh, Molly Ringwald, of course, um, uh, wanted to move on to more adult roles, and uh, kind of... Uh, pulled away and I guess John Hughes kind of resented that I guess but it's what I find interesting is that uh, she and Andrew McCarthy who were both in uh, Freddie and Pink went on together to do Fresh Horses which you were also in <laughs> oh that's right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. what was your experience who was, who huh? was Molly supposed to play in some kind of wonderful um not uh, the drummer girl Leah's role? I am. Yeah, I think it was Leah Thompson. Huh. Yeah, I I read I read that uh, when I was uh, getting ready for my interview with you. I was looking up uh, your credits and reading some backgrounds and stuff like that, and uh, I just found it interesting that um, Molly Ringwald and Andrew McCarthy just came off Pretty in Pink, which of course John Hughes had uh, directed. So, I, yeah, I believe it was Leah Thompson's role, if I if I remember correctly, although don't quote me on it. I don't have the information right in front of me, but huh. although Leah Thompson was not a bad choice, so. Oh, goodness, no. No, I mean, she just came off Back to the Future, so. But, uh, yeah, but it's it's interesting you came from some kind of wonderful, and you ended up working on a movie with uh uh, Molly Ringwald and Andrew McCarthy for uh, Fresh Horses. So, uh, uh, what was your experience like on that film? That was really fun because um, I got to go back to the Midwest. It was shot in um, Cincinnati, and um, uh, sometimes we were, oh we we even got rehearsal for that movie, which was fantastic. Um, that was a lot of fun because uh, you know I met Ben there ben stiller and we just had a lot of fun we just we played a lot and um i just remember i also think we got to see daily sometimes which is weird um i just remember molly had um fantastic taste in clothes she's yeah. she's also really beautiful she's also a really beautiful woman um a young woman she had fantastic taste in clothes you know she's playing a, a girl on the wrong side of the tracks and fresh horses but she she's got a lot of taste and style and i always dressed like hell um on the, <laughs> i'm going to and from set you know i just i don't have a lot of taste i dress to be comfortable and i think i was wearing sweats all the time and at one point i just turned to molly and said molly come on don't you ever really want to just dress like me and she she just looked at me, and she just looked me up and down, and she paused, and she goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought it was so funny. And I, it's because she looked great. She looked like a million bucks. But, I mean, I, and I, I, that would be hard for me. I mean, I think she was wearing, you know, maybe not high heels, but, you know, some sort of high heel boots or what. I mean, she just looked fantastic all the time. And, I, and for me to have done that, I, I it would have... A cost a lot of money, and B, it just would have taken so much effort that I I assume that people really want to dress like I do, but then I don't dress very attractively. So um, yeah, but you get a very you, me up. you you get a very down to earth appeal though. I think that's one of the <laughs> things that work with you. I'm very down to earth. That's it. <laughs> that's true. But I gotta say, Molly had beautiful hair though. That uh, that reddish orange hair. She does. She did, and she did. And uh, but in Fresh Horses, she wore a wig. Yes. Now. Uh, you can tell. Ac actually, for me, I actually have not seen Fresh Horses. Oh, I see. Yeah, I did see uh, some she's, kind of wonderful. Pretty. She's pretty wonderful in it. And Viggo Mortensen is just like one of his first movies, and he's amazing in it. Oh, uh, that was be that was uh, before he worked with Cronenberg and. Fought for the ring and <laughs> oh yeah now he's captain he's really good now he's captain he's fantastic really good in this movie you can see it's like oh my god this guy is 
plays for keeps. I mean, I thought he was real. I mean, it, he's just terrific in the movie. Um, and so is Molly. Yeah, I, I brought that one up because I thought it was interesting that um, with the John Hughes connection and you had um, John Hughes, of course, wrote uh, some kind of wonderful and he wanted to get uh, Molly Ringwald in it after Pretty in Pink. And um, and uh, she was in Pretty in Pink with Andrew McCarthy. And so they both kind of went to fresh horses. So that, that was why I wrote that title down. I had to ask you about it. Now, you did do a, a rather interesting, um, <laughs> I remember seeing this film. Actually, I saw this one over at that Twin Cinemas that's no longer open either. The Ringmaster, the Jerry Springer <laughs> film. <laughs> I liked it. You played this trailer trash mom of Jamie Presley, and you guys go on the Jerry Springer show. Yeah. Tell me that about that. Huh? Was fun. <laughs> That's maybe one of the most fun times I've ever had. Um, I, I don't know. It was just a wacky, you know. That character could not be farther from me, or <laughs> further from me, and um, and I just was really lucky that um, Neil Abramson hired me. Um, it was fun. It was really fun. It was, um, Neil is a documentarian and, um, I mean, aside from a filmmaker, but he, and, but he's also has done a, a several doc, um, uh, documentaries. And he, uh, so there was a lot of handheld stuff, but handheld stuff, not with a steady cam. And handheld stuff back in 1980, 98, or whenever it was actually shot, um, was, uh, oh, the stuff was really heavy. It's not like today. And it, I think they shot on film. So we, so it's, it wasn't video. Uh, the stuff was really heavy and they were just following us around with cameras and it was just wild. And, um, and so the look of I, I I love that movie. I think it's really funny, and I think um, that cast is howlingly funny too. I think Jamie's really great in it, and and I don't know. I, I that was really a tremendous amount of fun. Oh, you and Jamie Presley. Like, let's talk about some awkward moments in that film. <laughs> she's she's having. Uh, She's have you catch her having sex. You run out and you grab her boyfriend. I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, that was uh, pretty funny. <laughs> what was Jerry Springer like? He was really he's he is. Did he used to be the mayor of Cleveland or the mayor of Cincinnati? Anyway. You can tell he was a politician because he's 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 very egalitarian and he sort of gives you the impression that you you really get to know him. He's very kind and he's very self-effacing, um, and so it was really easy working with him. But you but it, it's all I mean I, I actually thought I got to know him and of course I didn't get to know him. Uh, he only uh, you know shows you the side that he's going to show publicly, but he's extremely. Um, he's really super kind. He's he's kind and he's forthcoming and he's he's uh, you know interested in people and asks questions and and kind of like the show. He <laughs> kind of like his talk show. I mean, he's inherently likable. He's just really super likable. Yeah, and you, can, and you get why he's just so popular and continues to be. Did you watch his show before the movie? Like, you, did... oh yes, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they uh, they had some um, an odd assortment of characters come in that movie, and uh, and uh, some of the shenanigans they they got in, and of course Jerry Springer stuck in the middle of it. Now. Uh, Another film that you had on your... Now, this one here I have not seen either, and I, I saw it in your credits, and I kind of looked it up, and um, um, 
It's Love Shack. Now, I guess it's not based on the B-52s song. No. I watched a trailer for that. Now, <laughs> tell me about that film. That's a mockumentary about the porn industry. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it's wickedly funny. And uh, it's, it's, so it's a mockumentary, so there's, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, interviews with people, and then you see, you know, snippets of, you got to see it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. Yeah. And most of it was improvised. The storyline was set out for us, but then it was mostly improvised. And then Pete Gardner, who plays my husband in it, um, is now on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and he's just so funny. And he's so funny in, in Love Shack, and he's so funny on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, He played he, a, a show on the CW. He played your husband in Love Shack? Yeah. So what, what was your role in this movie? We... Pete and I were um, porn stars back in the day, back in the 80s. Okay. And it's it's a reunion of sorts. The, the movie is a reunion of porn stars. Okay. And so Pete and I were, you know, a couple back in the 80s and uh, did a series of movies. And then we got married. Kind of like the mighty wind, only in the porn version. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> you, you, you two are the uh, the Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, the film. <laughs> That's right, exactly. And then I, I I saw this film, but I don't remember you in it. And I'm a you know, very co uh, controversial film called Red State. Now I like Kevin Smith. Now, who are you in Red State? Oh, I I did a favor. <laughs> um, uh, I am. I don't even say anything. I'm. Um, I'm John Goodrich's wife. He has to wake up early in the morning, and I basically serve him coffee. Oh, John Goodman's wife in the movie? I mean Goodman, not Goodrich. He's a friend. Oh, I remember where you were. Goodman. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I don't even have any lines. I literally am there to show that this man has a wife and something to die for. Maybe. That's what they live for. So why did you do the film if you didn't have any because lines? Because I love Kevin Smith. <laughs> What's your favorite Kevin Smith movie? Um, Me, it's Clerks. That might be my favorite, yeah. But I also like Dogma. I don't know. Oh, Dogma was good, yeah. I, I don't know. I just really... I also just like him. I mean, I like his... I think he's a really upfront, open guy, and I, I love the way he talks to the public, and I like how he interacts with the public and his fans, and and I just think he's a really cool guy. And um, and so, uh, I mean, I didn't know him, but they, you know, they called me up and I'm like, they, you, you want to do this? I'm like, yes, I do want to do this. <laughs> yes, please, I will do whatever. Yeah, I, and he was really nice. He was a great guy. He was as great as I thought he would be. You know, he strikes me as being a great guy. I think that um, I, I like Kevin Smith. I know he struggled with his uh, uh, movies being released because of the way marketing costs go. And, and it's funny listening to podcasts, uh, hearing him go off about that. But I love the relationship he has with his wife, um, Jennifer, and um He's got a really good relationship with her, her, and uh, he seems very, very, very down to earth. So, yeah. um, I, I think that um, Red State uh, was a very different term for him. Very well done movie. I think that was his uh, response to the Westboro Baptist Church, which, thankfully, us here in Canada, we kicked their asses out of here. <laughs> Oh, that there Fred Phelps did a, a video where he had a, a picture of the Canadian flag upside down. He said he was going to fly that flag upside down outside his church for some kind of stupid bullshit they were doing here. And we just laughed it off because he called us a demonic country. 
But yet this demonic wow. country just planted its maple leaf shaped foot up his ass and kicked him clear <laughs> back to Topeka, Kansas, or whatever hellhole he, he came out of, which you go back to. I don't like those people. No, no, neither do I. No. Yeah. But uh, Kevin Smith was making his statement uh, about them. And uh, I come from a Christian household, you know, and even I, uh, there's limits. And and, and Westboro is a a major limit for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But again, very well made independent film by Kevin Smith and. Had some uh, good actors in that. Stephen Root, John Goodman, Kevin Pollack, um, Melissa Leo. And, and the, but, the, the you know, the preacher, Michael Parks. Oh, Michael I mean, Parks. How could just, I friggin' forget him? I mean, he just knocked it out of the park. I mean, he was just unbelievably brilliant. Oh, he, he's even great, like, in the Quentin Tarantino movies. He's got a very yeah. strong presence. Yeah, he's, he's just really great. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know what? I, I found you on your uh, your web page, and um, I was very very happy to get you on there, get on there, and be able to make contact with you. Would you like to uh, talk about your web page and what you're doing on there? Well, I occasionally write, um, and then I'm on Twitter. So my website is just mollyhagen.com, and then my Twitter is I guess it's at Molly Hagen. And um, I've start I, occasionally I'll write a blog, but it's not <laughs> like once every maybe four months. But I also started writing, and I have this interactive uh, piece that's going to be um, uh, going to be probably launched uh, in December by a company called Eco, um, and it's um, it's a, a small series that I wrote where the viewer can interact with the story to, to see who they follow or um, to see who they follow in the piece. Kind of like and time code, huh? That for like, hmm? Kind of like time code, right? Did you ever see that movie um, time code that had the four images on the screen? Yeah, and... we, uh, we, tr- we, this is a comedy. Okay. Um, but uh, our original thought was to sort of have that go along, but uh, we've, so there's three stories that happen concurrently, lifetime code, and um, we've changed the interactive part of it so that it's it's slightly different than that because it was just too confusing. Like if you just switched over to one storyline, it was like it was just too confusing. So we're we're working on it, and uh, it should be launched in December. And it's some um, called the Garage Sale, and okay. it's got a lot of wonderful actors in it, and it's pretty funny. Wow. And touching and heartwarming. So um, you, well, you, you get a Facebook as well? Uh, no. No? <laughs> you haven't gone that no. route, huh? No. no. I, I'm, but I, I'll have to find you on Twitter. I'll have to follow you on Twitter. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, I'll follow you on Twitter. You got any charities or anything you're involved with? Um, I... I used to donate a lot of time to, this is local, called Tree People okay. in Los Angeles. And uh, now I, I used to do a lot of hands-on work with them, fundraising and stuff. Now I just kind of give money. But um, they're a really great uh, environmental organization in Los Angeles. And uh, they're at the forefront of, because we have such drought problems in California, and they're the, at the forefront of, like, working with the city to create um, uh viable water alternatives and creating watersheds out of things um uh, or not out of things uh, there are natural watersheds within the city that um can be cultivated and uh so i don't know it's a really great organization that uh brings a lot of different people together to solve a lot of problems for um los angelinos in southern california okay well, before I let you go, I got uh, a few things. Uh, um, I don't know um, when this is going to air out yet because I've you're my 56th interview, but um, 
uh, this week I'm set to play ep uh, episode number 44. So I'm on once a week here. So, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been very busy. I've gotten some good interviews on here, but um, I promise you, you will come. But um, when I do air yours out, and you'll have to be very patient with me on that because uh, I'm not sure when it might be uh, a um, couple months down the road, but um, no worries. When I do, I will send you a link so that you can post this wherever you please. Now, thank you. Yeah. Now this will be on the station website for about three months, and then it's going to go to my YouTube channel. Now, um, my YouTube channel. What I'm doing, I'm I'm putting the audio up on YouTube, and I'm putting pictures to go along with the audio. I was wondering if I had your permission to use any headshots of you to go along with that. Sure, they're kind of. What's that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You want me to send you something through the email? If you want to, actually, that was going to be my next question too, because I would love to get an autograph picture. I'd love to do that for you. Yeah. I gotta say, you don't wear much, if any, makeup. You're very attractive. I wanted to tell you that. Well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 55 now. I don't really know how attractive I am. But, uh, yeah, sure. I'd love to send you out a, a headshot or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Um, I would love to get an autograph. Now, do I just send, uh, send you my my mailing address, or? Uh... I think I have it, don't I? Is that not on the email? Yeah, well, send it to me. Yeah, I'll send you my mailing address. I I, I would love. I'd love to get an autograph. I think that would be that'd be awesome. And uh, and um, one last thing, I would love it if you would do a plug for my show. Sure. Yeah, just just say your name and um, say you're listening to Greg Gilbert, and my show is called Python's Paradise in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Have you ever been up this way before? No, that is very north and it's very east for me. And I like what time is it there? It's actually almost eleven o'clock. I know that's what I thought. Okay. Um, uh... It's called Python Paradise? Yeah, Python, like the snake. That's my DJ name, Pyth yeah. Python's Paradise. Yeah, my name's Python. Greg Gilbert. Yeah. Paradise. And Fredericton? Yeah. How do you say Fredericton? Is that, a, is that New Brunswick? Yeah, Fredericton. Yeah, Fredericton, New Brunswick. Yeah. We got the trailer part, and boys are our closest celebrities. <laughs> Are you so? Do you want me to say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in Fredericton, New Brunswick? Yeah. After you got okay. yeah. After you announce your name, yeah. After my name? Yeah. You got to say hi. Hi, I'm Molly Hagen. Oh yeah, I guess you would yeah. need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go. Hi, I'm Molly Hagen, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Well, Molly, here's celebrating uh, a wonderful career and celebrating election. Great movie. <laughs> Everybody should see it, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Definitely. Great movie. Wonderful movie. Reese Witherspoon, Matthew Broderick, Jessica Campbell's awesome speech, and, of course, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much greg i appreciate it thank you and i will be in touch god bless okay. you and thank you so much thank you bye-bye bye-bye